Gerald Ford summed up his concern for human values at the European Security Conference. When looking directly at Brezhnev, he proclaimed America's deep devotion to human rights and individual freedoms. To my country, he said, they are not cliches or empty phrases. Historians will debate for a long time over which president contributed most to victory in the Cold War. Few will dispute that the Cold War could not have been won had not Gerald Ford emerged at a tragic period to restore equilibrium to America and confidence in its, its international role. Sustained by his beloved wife, Betty, and to the children to whom he was devoted, Gerald Ford left the presidency with no regrets, no sec second guessing, no obsessive pursuit of his place in history. For his friends, he leaves an aching void. Having known Jerry Ford and worked with him will be our badge of honor for the rest of our lives. Early in his administration, General Ford said to me, I get mad as hell, but I don't show it when I don't do as well as I should. If you don't strive for the best, you will never make it. We are here to bear witness that Jerry Ford always did his best, and that his best proved essential to renew our society and restore hope to the world. Mrs. Ford, members of the Ford family, President and Mrs. Bush, Vice President and Mrs. Cheney, President and Mrs. Bush, President and Mrs. Carter, President and Mrs. Clinton, distinguished guests, my fellow Americans, it's a great privilege and an honor for me to be here. For the past week, we have been hearing the familiar lyrics of the hymns to the passing of a famous man, the hosannas to his decency his honesty, his modesty, and his steady-as-she-goes qualities. It's what we've come to expect on these occasions. But this time, there was extra value, for in the case of Gerald Ford, these lyrics have the added virtue of being true. Sometimes there are two versions to these hymns, one public and one private, separate and discordant. But in Gerald Ford, the man he was in public, he was also that man in private. Gerald Ford brought to the political arena no demons, no hidden agenda, no hit list or acts of vengeance. He knew who he was, and he didn't require consultants or gurus to change him. Moreover, the country knew who he was, and despite occasional differences, large and small, it never lost its affection for this man from Michigan, the football player the lawyer and the veteran, the congressman and suburban husband, the champion of Main Street values who brought all of those qualities to the White House. Once there, he stayed true to form, never believing that he was suddenly wiser and infallible because he drank his morning coffee from a cup with a presidential seal. He didn't seek the office, and yet, as he told his friend, the late great journalist Hugh Sidey, 
He was not frightened of the task before him. We could identify with him, all of us, for so many reasons. Among them, we were all trapped in what passed for style in the 70s, with a wardrobe, with lapels out to here, white belts, plaid jackets, and trousers so patterned that they would give you a migraine. The rest of us have been able to destroy most of the evidence of our fashion meltdown. But presidents are not so lucky. Those David Kennerly photographs are reminders of his endearing qualities. But some of those jackets, I think that they're eligible for a presidential pardon or at least a digital touch-up. As a journalist, I was especially grateful for his appreciation of our role, even when we challenged his policies and taxed his patience with our constant presence and persistence. We could be adversaries, but we were never his enemy, and that was a welcome change in status from his predecessor's time. To be a member of the Gerald Ford White House Press Corps brought other benefits as well as we documented a nation and a world in transition, in turmoil. We accompanied him to audiences with the notorious and the merely powerful. We saw Tito, Franco, Sadat, Marcos, Suharto, the Shah of Iran, the Emperor of Japan, China with Mao Zedong, Zhou Enlai, and Deng Xiaoping all at once. What was then the Soviet Union in Vladivostok with Leonid Brezhnev, and Helsinki, one of the most remarkable gatherings of leaders in the 20th century. There were other advantages to being a member of his press corps that we didn't advertise quite as widely. We went to Vail at Christmas and Palm Springs at Easter time with our families. Now, cynics might argue that contributed to our affection for him. That is not a premise that I wish to challenge. One of our colleagues, Jim Naughton of the New York Times, personified the spirit that existed in the relationship. He bought from a San Diego radio station promoter a large mock chicken head that had attracted the president's attention at a GOP rally. And then Giddy from 20-hour days and an endless repetition of the same campaign speech, Naughton decided to wear that chicken head to a Ford News conference in Oregon with the enthusiastic encouragement of the president and his chief of staff, Dick Cheney. In the next news cycle, the chicken head was a bigger story than the president, and no one was more pleased than the man that we honor here today in this august ceremony. When the president called me last year and asked me if I would participate in these services, I think he wanted to be sure that the White House press corps was represented the writers, correspondents, and producers, the cameramen, photographers, the technicians, and the chicken. He also brought something else to the White House, of course. He brought the humanity that comes with a family that seemed to be living right next door. He was every parent when he said, my children have spoken for themselves since they were old enough to speak, and not always with my approval. I expect that to continue in the future. And was there a more supportive husband in America than when his beloved Betty began to speak out on issues that were not politically correct at the time? Together, they put on the front pages and in the lead of the evening newscast the issues that had been underplayed in America for far too long. My colleague Bob Schieffer called him the nicest man he ever met in politics. To that, I would only add the most underestimated. In many ways, I believe football was a metaphor for his life in politics and after. He played in the middle of the line. He was a center, a position that seldom receives much praise. But he had his hands on the ball for every play, and no play could start without him.